Good morning, everyone. Pastor Brandon here, and I'm so excited that you're here today. It's so great to be with you, and church is going to start in just about four minutes. So this is a great time to fill up your coffee, and one of our core values as a church is to welcome all, and we would love for you to help us do that. And so if you will look for someone you don't know, tell them hello, ask how they're doing. Uh, if you're in person, you can do that, and if you're online, say hello in the chat and greet somebody. We would love to connect you with other members of our online community. I am so glad that you're here and can't wait to start worship in just a few moments. Hello and welcome to worship. My name is Megan Durham. I'm the children's director here at X2 and on behalf of me and the entire staff, we are so glad that you're joining us. If you have kids in your house and you're looking for our weekly children's content, you can visit acts2.info to find um, a weekly video with our Bible story and memory verse and the so-and-so show there. Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Brandon Blackson, the executive pastor here at Acts 2, and it is so good to be with you. And it, we would love for you to let us know that you're here. And so if you'll open the Acts 2 app, you can search Acts 2 UMC in the App Store if you don't have it. But we'd love for you to let us know that you're worshiping with us and how we can be praying for you today. You can also find sermon notes in the app. And each morning we send out a daily reading and reflection on every weekday. And so it's a great way to start your day as well. It's going to be an awesome morning of worship. We're going to sing God's praises with an awesome set from our band. We're also going to hear God's word read and proclaimed, and we're going to celebrate communion together. So whether you're worshiping online or in person, I am so glad you're here. Acts 2 Worship starts now. Let's go. 
your day So I better stop right now And it might get loud It might get loud start the morning. Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. For that is who we are, created in the image of God, but still very much in need of God's grace. My name is Taylor Trousdale. I'm the youth director here at Acts 2. And for those of you here in person with me and those online, welcome. Good morning. We're so glad you're here in worship with us. Um, the first thing we'd like you to do now that you're here is to check in and let us know. You can do that in two ways. If you're here in person, there will be a white card um, on the chair in front of you, um, and you can fill that out as much as you'd like. Um, and there's a place on the back for prayer requests. The second way that you can do that um, is you can download the Acts 2 app. Very simple, very easy. And there's a place to check in online. Let us know um, that you were here, and then you can also submit a prayer request there too. Um, and we do pray over all those prayer requests. We love to know um, how we can keep you in our prayers this week. So I hope that you'll take advantage of that. 
Um, if you have been here and worship with us before, you know that every single week it's our tradition to remember who we are and why we're here um, by saying together our dream, our goal, and our strategy as a church. So if you could please stand as you are able. Let's say these words together. Our dream is to create a people who sing God's praises, serve God's children, and share God's salvation until Christ comes again. Our goal is to help non-religious and non-active Christians become radical Christ followers. Our strategy found in Acts 2.42 is this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. We, as Christians, we also hold true the beliefs written so long ago in the Apostles' Creed, which unite us in faith uh, with Christians all around the world. Let's declare these truths together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly God, we thank you so much for this morning, uh, for this beautiful weather, the beautiful sun, and this beautiful chance um, to worship you um, with all of our um, brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. God, we ask that your spirit would fill our hearts and open our ears to hear your word, um, and that we would experience the joy of Jesus this morning and for the rest of our week. All things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Shout out 
may be seated. Let's have the kids come forward. Come on up. It's a very exciting day because we have ice cream today. 
over at the children's building. Looking forward to that. It's promotion Sunday. There it is. How cool is that? We do love a good pun around here, don't we, Brandon? We do. So anyway, Miss Megan's got a good word for us today. It's so great to see you all today. Good morning, friends. Do I have any first-time pre-K friends up here today? Parents, if you have children who will be entering pre-K in the fall, um, you don't have to check them into the nursery. They can just come to the children's moment and then go next door to Children's Church with us. Yeah. Okay. And then I have some of our, um, our fifth graders who just finished school. Some of you still have a few more days, but our fifth graders have moved on um, to youth. And so they get to do fun things with the youth group. Um, and then a lot of you will be in different classrooms this morning because we're all bumping up to the grade we'll be in um, when we start fall programming. So I'm so proud of you guys. You've made it through the last week of school. Some of you have a few more days. I know you can do it. And then we get to um, do all the fun things that summer brings. This morning, the grown-up are talking about forgiveness. Now, when someone hurts you, have they ever said, I'm sorry, and you just say, it's okay? Do you ever say that? I know it's the easy thing to say when someone says, I'm sorry I did that, and you just say, it's okay. But it's not always okay. Sometimes they really hurt your feelings, okay? So when someone says, I'm sorry, you can say, thanks for saying that, and then does anyone know what goes after that? What do we say, Colt? Please don't do it again, but then we say, I forgive you, okay? And that means that we can forget about it. We don't have to all the way forget about it. We can still remember and kind of guard ourselves from being hurt again. But we say that we forgive them, and then we move on, and then we don't hold it against them, okay? Because some friendships are really important. We have to learn how to um, make them work. So the grown-ups are going to keep talking about forgiveness. We're going to go next door and talk about resilience, and then we'll be back over here to take communion with our families. But before we head over, Pastor Brandon, will you pray for us? Yeah, let's pray. God, we're so grateful for each of these, your children, both here in the sanctuary and worshiping online and all your children around the world. And we pray that you would watch over them, that you care for them, that you would help them to become the people you created them to be, and that they would be people of forgiveness, who, who whenever someone wrongs them, that, um, that they're willing to do the work of reconciliation and forgiveness and that they set an example of what that looks like because they know that they are forgiven by you. We're grateful for your love. We're grateful that you're with us and that you forgive us no matter what. We ask all this in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. All right, our children are gonna head next door to our children and youth building during the sermon. They'll be back afterward to take communion with their families. And if you've got children um, and you'd prefer for them to stay in here with you, that's perfectly fine. We love having children in worship. That's how we learn to worship. So whatever works best for your family, that's great with us. We've also got a nursery in this building. It's through those doors and to the right. And we also have a nursing room. It's through those doors to the right in between the double doors and the vestibule. And so those are available to anyone who needs them. We're so glad you're here. Will you stand as you're able? Let's continue to worship together.
thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand Lord God, we do thank you that you are with us, that you are for us, that your face is always toward us as you look in love upon your children. We thank you that as our praises have gone up this morning, that your very spirit and presence has come down to be with us, to visit with us, to teach us, to guide us, to make us new for the very transformation of the world. And so as we read your scriptures, we hear your word. We pray that your will would be done here in this place now and always. In Jesus' mighty name. And all who agree say, amen. Our scripture lesson today is Paul's letter to the Colossians, uh, chapter 3. This is one of those amazing verses and chapters in the Bible that you could spend the rest of your life just reading and memorizing and working on day after day after day. Let's share in God's good word together. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, 
forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Just as you have been forgiven, you also must forgive. That's the way it works. It's just the way it works. Because the moment that forgiveness stops, relationship stops. The moment forgiveness stops, community stops. And the world begins to break down. My name is Mark Foster. I'm the founding senior pastor here at Acts 2, and it is our great joy to have you with us. We are in a series on joy, um, how to find it, how to keep it, how to share it with others. And there are eight pillars or qualities uh, about joy, that things that lead into joy. They're pathways to peace and to joy. And so if you're here for the first time uh, with us, welcome. This is week five of this series. And so we are just now uh, starting into matters of the heart. The first four weeks were matters of the mind. And so as a way of introduction, uh, did you know that God is in favor of a good time? He actually is, is happy. I mean, if you look through the Old Testament, there's party after party after party after party to celebrate this or give thanks for that. You had all these sorts of offerings and gatherings where people would come from all over the country to have meals like Thanksgiving together to celebrate all that God had done for them. Theologian Jürgen Moltmann puts it like this. He says, we are created for joy. Will you say that with me? We are created for joy. We're born for joy. You're born for that. And if you've been at the birth of a child, you get this. It is a joyful thing. It's a painful thing. It can be a scary thing, but it's also one of the most joyous moments in life. So it is true that not only were we made for joy, but we worship a God of joy. Psalm 100 is probably my favorite psalm. Um, psalm 23 is really good too, but Psalm 100 is awesome. I love this. Um, it, says, it says this, make a joyful noise to the Lord. What kind of noise? Joyful, yeah. All the earth worship the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with what? Singing, right? Know that the Lord is God, it is he that has made us, we are his, we are his people, and we are the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with what? Praise. Yeah. Give thanks to him, the scripture says. Right? This is the songbook of the church. Bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations, like we just sang about. To all generations. And this joy is important. It is the very essence of life. Joy is linked to goodness and wonder to God's holy presence and to extravagant love. It's much, much more than happiness. Bishop Desmond Tutu says it like this, joy is much bigger than happiness. While happiness is often seen as being dependent on external circumstances, joy is not. Every person can have joy and you can have it in any situation because it comes from God and our joy goes back to God. So over the last four weeks, we have looked at these four qualities of the mind. Perspective, humility, humor, and acceptance. Will you say those four with me? Perspective, humility, humor, and acceptance. And if you're interested, you can go back um, online. If you're online now um, or here, you can go back. All our sermons are online, and you can just go and see them in, at any time. And so, week one, joy is a matter of perspective. When we move from I and me to what? To us and we, right? About community. That's where we find joy. Week two, we talked about humility. And Jesus taught us that we are not the center of the universe. Who is? God is, right? And if it's all about you, just get ready for the pain, right? Because we're not made for that. Only God is made to be the center of the world. And week three is about humor. It allows us to see the ridiculous in us all. People are pretty funny. And to see our common humanity. We all make mistakes. Uh, we all do funny things. And that's what makes family so fun. Now you have these family stories, family jokes, uh, things that people say. And you're like, yep, that was a good time. That was funny. Uh, moms and dads can be funny. Grandmas and grandpas can be funny. Cousins, aunts, uncles. It's, life is funny if you think about it. And then last week we talked about acceptance. And certainly that is super important. And we have to understand it's not resignation. It's certainly not defeat. It is the only place that change can begin. You, you can't do anything until you accept the reality of where you are. So until you accept that a season has ended, you can't start a new one. Will you say that with me? Until you accept that a season has ended, you can't start a new one. You can't start a new one. 
And it, you don't have to think very hard or very long to see some of the saddest things in the world are people whose season has well passed, and yet they're still trying to live there. And you can see that over and over again, whether it's professionally or athletically or in a relationship. It's time to move on, but they're still acting as if it was 1970 or 1980 or whatever it may be. And it's just sort of odd. You're like, oh, that's weird and sad. So my admonition is don't let that be you, right? We have to accept where we are so that we can start a new season where God is calling us to go. Douglas Abrams, in his book of joy, he says this, when we accept the present, we can forgive and release the desire for a different past. But we have to accept the present. And that leads to what we're going to talk about today, which is forgiveness. Those two go together, acceptance and forgiveness. This happened, this hurt, that's the reality of it. And now, because I see it clearly, not as I want it to be, but as it is, I can forgive that and move on, be released from it. In the Hebrew, forgiveness is to untie. That's really the metaphor. Something's tied up, locked up together. It's simply to untie. It, it's not an emotional response. It's not a good or bad value. It's simply whether you're tied to something and caught in it and trapped in it, or you're untied from it and you're free. That's what forgiveness does. It's a gift to the person who does the forgiving, and often to the person being forgiven as well. So today we begin looking at the qualities of the heart that lead to joy, the first of which will be forgiveness. So the first quality of the heart that leads to joy is what? Say with me. Forgiveness. Super important, super hard. And, and really, most of the things that we talk about forgiveness, like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to forgive them for this or that, it's really petty. I mean, it's really small stuff. And this, to me, is hard to talk about because when, when you really get to the bottom of forgiveness, there are people who have forgiven so much. So much. And, and I think part of that is because they have a closeness to Christ and they understand how much they have been forgiven. And so therefore, they're able to forgive others in large measure. Some of the most people, joyful people I've ever met are people who've been forgiven much because they understand they've been given a second chance. So we come across these stories all over the world, all across time. But one of the ones um, that they talked about and that I, I studied this week, uh, it really stopped me. And so I, I was interested and there's a, a young man, he's no longer a young man, but back in 1972, on May 4th, this little 10-year-old boy was on his way home from school. Now, he, his life was changed forever. He simply ran past an army lookout post that was at the edge of his school's playground. And a British soldier fired a rubber bullet from only 10 feet away, and it blinded him for life. He could see perfectly before that. Just a, a normal little 10-year-old boy caught in the crossfire of that time and that place. His name is Richard Moore. You can read about him. And he didn't, oddly, he did not harbor any bitterness. This is actually the bullet here, May 5th, 1972. For 38 years, he wanted to meet the man who shot the bullet, who was to his right. So in 2006, he'd always wanted to meet him. Richard, the little boy, actually meets Charles for the first time. Not only did he forgive him, the two became close friends. Caught up in that tragedy, both wounded in different ways. And amazingly, from childhood to the present day, he has never allowed his blindness to hinder his development. He actually went on to start an incredible, an incredible nonprofit. So in 1996, Richard felt the need to harness all of these things that he had learned at the service of humanity, particularly children like himself who had been caught in the crossfire. So he started a, a nonprofit called Children in Crossfire, and it was born at that time. So he does work all around the world because, as you know, when adults don't forgive, when adults war, it's the children that get the worst of it. And so this... This work that he does now has its roots in the tragedy that happened to him when he was only 10 years old. So then in 2007, uh, this is how I found it in the book, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama came and visited the two men. He really 
he was really moved by this forgiveness and this compassion and the energy and the joy that was released. And the Dalai Lama said, whether you believe it or not, talking to Richard, you are my hero. You are my hero and a wonderful son of humanity. Despite your tremendous pain, he said to him, you don't have any anger. You're at peace. You accept what has happened. You have peace of mind. You are a good example. You're a good model. There's power in forgiveness. And we, we often get caught up about forgive and forget. You've heard that. You know, if you don't forgive, or you can't forget. Or if you don't forget, maybe you haven't forgiven. Well, here's, here's all I know about this. This was anonymous, and it's helping me this week. It says, if you can't forgive and forget, just pick one. Right? Just, just pick one of them. Because if you forgive, you're going to be okay. And if you forget, you're probably going to be okay. Right? Just, just pick one. Because the reality is that pain and suffering come to all of us, don't they? Nobody escapes pain and suffering. It comes in different forms, different times, different seasons. But how we respond, how you respond, is your choice. You get to choose. Another way of saying it is that pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. But pain comes to us all. And so the path of joy is connection. To, to see that pain, to understand it, and to be connected with others through it. And the path of sorrow is what? Isolation. It's also dangerous as we continue to see one mass shooting after another. Where people become isolated, they become alone, and they get a manifesto, they see something online, and then more pain is propagated. Isolation is dangerous, friends. And sorrowful. Connection is our pathway to peace and to joy. Our problem, really, in our country, in our town, all over the world, is loneliness. That's our problem. And forgiveness is the antidote to loneliness. Because if you can't forgive, you can't have any friends. Right? I mean, if you can't forgive, then you, you can't be in relationship, which makes you alone. And that's where loneliness comes from. It's a byproduct of unforgiveness. So we have to get this right. We have to learn how to do this. Bishop Tutu says it like this. He says, perhaps our synagogues, our temples, and our churches are not as welcoming as they should be. I really think that we do need for these fellowships to do a great deal more to have those who are lonely come and share. Not in order to increase their records or ranks, but really just keenly interested in one person who comes and gets what they did not have before. Warmth and fellowship to break down the loneliness. Break down the loneliness. That's, that's part of why we're here, friends. To help non-religious and non-active folks connect with Jesus, connect with us, become radical Christ followers, to follow him. People used to ask me, well, Mark, how, how big is Acts 2 going to get? How big should it be? And I'm like, that is a weird question to me. The church has work to do until every lonely person finds a friend in us, in Christ. There's still more than 30,000 people within five minutes of this place that have no connection to anybody by self-report. Not connected to any religious community whatsoever or church. And, and if you poll people, you'll see how lonely they are. It is a problem, friends. Nearly half of Americans report having fewer than three close friends. How many close friends do you have? Just think about it. Now, what's, what's really difficult about this statistic is that this is twice as many as 1990. It, I mean, it's, it's basically double, 49% to be exact. And one in 10 people say they have no close friends at all. And that's a problem. And that's dangerous. And it means that they can't get the help that they need. Because when they fall, there's no one to pick them up. When they get in financial trouble, there's no one to help them out. When they go to jail, there's no place to bail them out. When they miss a payment, they lose their home. Because they don't have a friend at all. This loneliness is a real problem. So since 1992, the number of Americans who say they have no one to talk to about important matters quadrupled. Just the breakdown of community. Um, years ago, there was a, a book called Bowling Alone by Putnam. I'd recommend it to you. There's, and there's been a lot of research done since then. But this idea of connecting with others, having someone to talk to, it's super important. It's, why, it's how we were made. It's not good for humanity to be alone, the scripture says. And 
in a study between Duke and the University of Arizona, one in four people say they have no one with whom to discuss important matters. 25% of the folks, one in four. And so it basically comes down to this. When you focus too much on yourself, you become disconnected and alienated from others. Because if it's all about you, then you get offended, then you don't forgive, and then you're alone. That's how it works. However, you have a choice about this. The Dalai Lama would say it like this. You actually have the choice to connect with everyone. Every time you meet someone, you can see your common humanity in them. Around here, what we say as a staff, and I hope that you'll do the same, is every person that walks on this property, we are to see and relate to as if they are Christ himself. So that when somebody comes on our property, we welcome them. We are honored that they are here because we understand that God has brought them here. They've been wooed here by the Holy Spirit. That you today have been brought here, not by me. I didn't call you and say, hey, come here. You came on your own, some way, somehow. We don't know how, but we understand that God himself is in each and every one of you and you online. And we welcome that and we honor that and we bless that. And we trust God to do something good with that as he continues to build community right here on this corner of Penn and Covell. So the Dalai Lama would say it like this, if you are always thinking about the seven billion human beings, you'll never experience loneliness, right? I mean, there's seven billion of us. You can't be alone. You're surrounded by people, more people than have ever lived on the planet before. You're not alone. You're surrounded by love. And so, of course, God's solution is forgiveness and community. And Jesus models this perfectly for us. He models forgiveness upon the cross at every turn, and he's always in community. Now, if I'm God, and I'm thinking, how am I going to save the world? Twelve country bumpkins is not my idea of a good plan which is what Jesus did. He called 12 disciples. And I have a mentor of mine, he says, that, you know, they're called the disciples for a reason. Right? <laughs> they're not that sharp all the time. Bishop Tutu would say like this, forgiveness is the only way to heal ourselves and to be free from the past. That's where that new day starts, with acceptance and forgiveness. So when Jesus came to save the world, he did it in community with these 12 disciples. Maybe you learned this as a little kid. It's found in Luke 6. It says, Now during those days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. And when day came, Jesus called his disciples and chose the twelve of them, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter. We know that one. And his brother Andrew, the first one to see the Lord and to woo Peter. And James and John. We, we know their names, perhaps. And Philip. And now we get to some other folks we don't know as much about. Bartholomew. And Matthew, and Thomas, and James, son of Alphaeus, and another Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot. We know that one, too, who became a traitor. This is how God chooses to love, to save the world, through these 12 people and their families. They live and move and have their being together for about three years in ministry. And before that, Jesus is simply running the family business in a very small town, in Galilee, called Nazareth. It's a tiny little place. You can still go there today. It's not big. It'd be sort of like uh, a little town in western Oklahoma. Pretty, you know, much like a desert. Just a few things growing out there. Agricultural in nature. Not a lot going on. It's how Jesus grew up. And so as we look at this, as we look at Jesus' life, and we look at our need for forgiveness, there are three things that we have to get right just off the front. And that are, that's this. That we all sin and need forgiveness. Say that with me. We all sin and need forgiveness. Every one of us. Nobody escapes that. That's one. Number two is this. God is willing to forgive us. Absolutely. Each and every one of us. Will you say that with me? God is willing to forgive us. That's great news. But the problem is, of course, that it's hard to experience that if you're not in community. Because it's just a voice in your head. Am I forgiven? I don't know. I think so. Is that just me or is that God? But the reality is that community stops, right? Um, and so we are to forgive others. That, that's the third one, right? Say that with me. We are to forgive others. And that's so important because community stops when forgiveness stops. It just, that's, that's how it works. So we have to understand the importance of forgiveness for everything we do together in our lives. Again, Bishop Tutu would say it like this. Without forgiveness, we remain tethered to the person who harmed us. Remember that untie thing we talked about? 
We remain tethered. We are bound to the chains of bitterness, tied together, trapped, until we can forgive the person who harmed us. That person will hold the keys to our happiness. That person will be our jailer. When we forgive, we take back control of our own fate and our feelings. We become our own liberator. Both when we forgive others and, as you know very well, when you forgive yourself. Because that can be super difficult, too. But then you're free. You're free. You know how you feel after a really big cry? Like some guys my age are like, I don't remember that. It's been a long time. But there's, there's this, this cleansing, this, this goodness, this, that, that deep breath where it's just, okay, that's done. And I can start over. Now, Bishop Tutu uh, also wrote a book uh, a while back called The Book of Forgiving. And in that book, he talks about um, in South Africa, they have this word called Ubuntu. And it means I am because you are. My humanity is connected to your humanity. It's all wrapped up together. I mean, you, they, they can't be apart from one another. And so in this book, he, he has a graph about what he calls the revenge and forgiveness cycle. And it looks like this. Friends, we, we know this. Hurt and harm and loss come to us all, don't they? Everybody experiences that. And then you have a choice to make because this causes pain. And you can either choose to harm or you can choose to heal. It's your choice every time. So hurt, harm, loss, pain. If you choose harm, you reject the shared humanity. Then you go and you think through and you do either revenge, retaliation, or payback. Which leads, of course, to more violence and more cruelty. Which leads you back to hurt, harm, and loss. And you pain, and then you can choose harm, and it never ends. Never ends. Never ends. Or, you're hurt, you experience pain, and you choose to heal. Now, it's not just, oh, well, I choose to heal. No, it's you tell the story. This is what happened. This is what happened to me. This is what I experienced. This is what I saw. You tell the story. You name the hurt. And this is how that wounded me. This is how this wounded my family system. And then, you, because you've told the story, because you've accepted, because you've named the hurt, you're being sober about it, then, and really only then, can you grant forgiveness because you recognize the shared humanity. Because you do realize that pretty much everybody that's ever been terrible to you had somebody who was terrible to them. That's how they learned it. They didn't think it up on their own. So every pain that you've experienced is simply passed on pain that somebody else had poured into them that then is poured into you. And so you can step back and you can grant forgiveness because you can recognize how the cycle works. And because you forgive, you begin to break that cycle and you renew or you release the relationship and you find a new path, a new day. This is the choice. You can either choose harm or you can choose to what? Heal. This is the pathway to hell. This is the pathway to heaven. Just make no mistake about it. If you ever talk to anybody who's living over here, they'll tell you it's hell on earth. Because every day is a beating. Every day is hard. Every day you get hurt worse. And you expect worse. And it just goes and goes and goes. But you do have a choice. You can either choose harm or you can choose to heal. It's your choice. And it's really important, friends. And it's really hard sometimes. So we ask God, we ask Jesus, our Redeemer, to come in and help us choose the right. Help us choose to heal. And in his power, become people of grace. Be people of healing rather than harming. Now, I don't know who said this, but I think it's right. They said this is so important because it means not becoming the very thing that you can't forgive. Because if you think about what's hurt you and that you haven't forgiven, you become like that thing. And you pass it on. But you don't have to. So this idea of community, where we find new paths and new ways forward, it requires this ongoing practice of forgiveness. It's not just a one-time deal. That's why Jesus says, right, 70 times 7, not just once, not just twice, as long as it takes, friends, because we have to be people of forgiveness to remain in community. Again, Bishop Tutu would say this. He says, you have the potential to be instruments of incredible compassion and forgiveness. We cannot save anyone at all that they're totally unable to forgive. We all can. To be sorry for these others who are disfiguring their humanity. I think that's a great way of saying it. When somebody's being terrible, you know that they are not who they're created to be. You know that they are disfiguring their humanity in this way. And indeed, no one is incapable of forgiving. 
And no one is unforgivable. And of course, Jesus models this with Judas. If there's anyone who was unforgivable, it would have been Judas. But that wasn't Jesus' way. Jesus represents the God of forgiveness and grace and second chances. So knowing yourself to be loved by God provides you the goodness and power to share forgiving love with others. And this is shown throughout the world. But we cannot ask for ourselves what we deny to others. Will you say that with me? We cannot ask for ourselves what we deny to others. It doesn't work. It simply will not work. So Jesus says, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, that's pretty inclusive, by the way, right? Anything against who? Anyone. So that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. This is how it works, Jesus says. And this isn't, even, this isn't true just for us. Even across all of God's animal kingdom, forgiveness and peacemaking are extremely common. This really surprised me. Um, you may not know this guy. His name's Franz de Waal. And he believes that peacemaking activities are extremely common in the animal kingdom. He, he studied this his whole life. Maybe you've seen this. Maybe if you were at the zoo, uh, or you've seen photos of this. Chimps, they kiss and make up. They can actually forgive and do peacemaking. And other species do this as well. Uh, maybe, maybe you didn't know this. Sheep do this. Oh, aren't they cute? I mean, these, these two guys were in a fight an hour ago. Mom says make up. They did. Right? Uh, or, or goats. Have you ever seen a sad goat? No, they forgive, they make up, they move on, apparently. I didn't know this. Or dolphins. Oh, I have my permission, Chantel. Like, I don't know what your rift was, but it's clearly you've made up. Right? Right? And then there's some that really surprised me. Even hyenas. Right? Ooh, that'd be scary. But somehow they run in a pack. This is amazing, isn't it? There's only one species of animal in all that they've studied that does not forgive and make peace. You know what that is? <laughs> Isn't he cute? The domestic cat. And if you've owned one, you know this to be true. Right? Because he d that's not what he's thinking. He's sticking his tongue out at you. He's like, I don't like you. I'm a grumpy cat. Right? I mean, that's how he really feels. And if you're not careful, you know, he's going he's gonna to get you when you're least looking. So, I don't know what that says, but those of you who know me well, this won't surprise you. Okay. So, I love the way Archbishop Tutu says it. He says, friends, those who say forgiving is a sign of weakness haven't tried it. It's hard. It takes strength. Those who say forgiving is a sign of weakness, they have not tried it. Bishop Tutu, through apartheid, certainly knows this to be true, what he's had to forgive to move his country forward. And, of course, often people have the hardest time forgiving those closest to us because they wound us the deepest. They know us the best. They know how to do it. They've lived with us our whole lives. And so we, it, it's very difficult. But forgiveness was so important to Jesus that he gave his very life for it. He gave his lifeblood to do it. The scripture that we recount every week here is this. It says, Then Jesus took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, the disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for you, for the forgiveness of sins. It took his very blood so that you might have the power of forgiveness. Friends, don't waste it. Don't let it pass you by. God gave his very life that you would have the power to do it because it is life itself. And so as, as our close today, we always have an action step here. I, th and and I, hopefully this will help you. Now, I want you to list all the people who have good reason to be upset with you, but they're not. They're not. They're not upset with you. I mean, th think of the way... Can you, can you imagine back the way you disrespected your grandmother or your grandfather or an aunt or an uncle or a brother or a sister or a mom or a dad or a cousin or people you've just written off or somebody that you dismissed at work publicly? But somehow they forgave you. Somehow you're still in relationship. Somehow they love you. 
I mean, the, the one that, and this isn't a person, but for me, I don't know why my 14-year-old Snoodle still likes me. I don't like him much of the time. But he forgives me over and over and over again, even if I forget to take him outside when I'm supposed to, or even if I haven't fed him as fast as I'm supposed to. He still loves me. And you have people in your life like that. It doesn't seem to matter how terrible you've been. They just love you because they do. And if you've been afforded that, and by the way, if you're a friend with someone, that's probably them, right? Because we always have to be forgiven of something. So, so I encourage you to think through that because it's very helpful because it kind of lifts you go, oh, wow, I really am the recipient of that gift by so many people. And, and then be honest with yourself about all the subtle ways that we make people suffer when we've not forgiven them. We say we've forgiven them, but we avoid them. We say we've forgiven them, but we gossip about them. We say we've forgiven them, but we hold on to these negative thoughts about them. Right? So who comes to mind? Who comes to mind? You know, when somebody cuts me off in traffic, I'm like, I bet I know who that is. It's that person that I don't like. Right? That I haven't forgiven. So you forgive them. So here's the thing. What do you do? Say it with me. Forgive them. Untie yourself from that pain. From that sorrow, from that hurt, from that darkness in the world. And so I'm going to invite you here to say a prayer with me. It's, it's an important prayer, and it'll change your life if you do it. But in the prayer, there's going to be a place for a name of someone that you need to forgive or that you've not yet forgiven. So I want to give you a heads up that that's coming. So I want you to get that in your mind. And then if you will, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Lord, I come before you today with a humble heart to confess the mistakes I've made, both by what I've done and by what I haven't done. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer and forgive my failings. Lead me to do better. Help me to live a life that better reflects you. Now, by the power of your forgiveness, I choose to forgive everyone who has hurt me. Help me love, forgive, and have compassion, especially for Hold that there. Let the Lord bring that to mind. And hand that person to him. For their good. For your good. Now if you'll continue with me. Help me bless those who have hurt me. Make me kind and compassionate, forgiving others. Just as you forgave me. In Jesus' name, amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it is a great joy to be with you today, to be moving through this series with you. And I know some of this stuff is hard, but it's so life-giving. And I'm, I'm happy to celebrate that with you at any time. I'd love to hear your stories uh, and share with you and pray with you and bless you as we do this together. I do want you to know that um, here in just a few weeks, we're going to send folks to Guatemala. We're going to send folks to Memphis. Uh, we do incredible ministry all around uh, Edmond as well around the world. And what you give today makes all that happen. And so those of you who are part of our church um, and a part of our covenant community, we thank you for the incredible work you're doing all around the world. If you're a guest with us today, we don't want you to feel any obligation to give. Now, this is our gift to you, and we hope you feel welcome. We invite you now to give with glad and generous hearts. Jumping the hurdles In a garden that I'd rather you do it so much Keep it kind of worn out Always checking the boxes Trying to be flawless Cause we're spinning in my head
y'all pray with me. Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and all that you are doing in our midst. We pray, God, a blessing over this offering which we have received. And we ask, God, that you would put it in us to work so that the pain and hurt in this world might lessen, that there might be reconciliation, forgiveness, and healing. We pray all of this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. My name is Mike Landris, and I'm the director of discipleship here at Acts 2, and it's a pleasure to worship uh, with you this morning. We have a a lot going on in the life of the church, but first we want to celebrate that uh, last Sunday we received David Horton into membership. Uh, I've had the privilege of getting to be with David in a couple different small group experiences, and he's just an awesome guy. So if you get an opportunity to see David in the gathering space or here in worship, please be sure to uh, extend a warm welcome uh, to him. Uh, Today's an important day in the life of our church. It's Promotion uh, Sunday, where all of our students from pre-K all the way through 11th grade will go ahead and move up to the grade that they're going to roll into in the fall. And so after worship this morning and after our 1045 service, uh, we want to invite you to to go over to Building C, our children and youth building. Uh, If you have kids in that age range, you can go ahead and fill out all the forms you need for programming, for our summer activities, all the things uh, so that your kiddo will be good to go. Uh, And if you don't have a kiddo in that age range, we still encourage you to go next door. We've got uh, ice cream sundaes over there, so that should be incentive enough. But you can also see all of the amazing work that our early learning program is doing, that Megan and her uh, team of volunteers are doing, and that Taylor is doing. And so we just encourage you to take a few moments after worship this morning to go next door to Building C. And then next Sunday, May 29th, uh, we're going to kick off the summer together after worship. And so uh, we hope that you'll come back next week, invite a friend, and then after worship, hang around to grab a burger or a hot dog and just kick off uh, what's going to be an amazing summer of ministry uh, together. Uh, And then we also want to invite you to be in prayer for a couple of different uh, teams. The first is a water well team, which will be going to Guatemala June 4th through the 11th. Uh, So we hope that you will keep them in your prayers. Mark, this is our 32nd. 
This will be our 32nd water well that, that we put in there. And so uh, that's just amazing, amazing kingdom work. Yeah. And then we also uh, want you to keep our um, youth mission team in your prayers as they go off to Memphis, Tennessee to work with Service Over Self, uh, repairing homes in underserved neighborhoods there in Memphis. We've got a great team going and just invite you to uh, hold them in your prayers. Pastor Mark? Oh, was I supposed to pitch to Brandon? Yep. My bad. I, I seek your forgiveness. You got it. Yeah, see? How easy is that? Brandon, come on up uh, with me. You do your thing. I'll do the bread. Okay. We, um, we also want to say thank you. We've had, uh, some of you all know, our, our portable buildings out here have been redone recently, and that's been um, almost exclusively volunteer. And so we've had guys who have been out here almost every weekend for the last few months and working so hard in the heat, and we're so grateful. It looks awesome. There's a brand new deck that they built from, I mean, literally from the ground up. And so check it out if you haven't seen it. And I'm going to kind of put them on the spot. If, you, if you've helped with that project, would you mind standing up so we can say thank you? Thanks, guys. So they've, they've been working so hard, and it's going to be awesome. We've got the YMCA coming on Monday, and uh, they'll be out there in a great and welcoming space. And so we're so grateful for all the work that went into that. And uh, we're grateful because now we have the opportunity to come together and celebrate as we remember what our Lord has given for us. And so we remember that on the last night of Jesus' life, as he gathered with his disciples, he took bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of all that Christ has done for us, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with his offering for us. Let's pray together. Oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And all God's people say, Amen. I'll invite our communion servers to come up at this time to serve the gifts of God for the people of God. And in just a few moments, those of you who are in the sanctuary will be invited to come forward to receive those gifts. Whenever you do, you'll be offered a piece of bread, and you'll be told this is the body of Christ broken for you. You'll then be offered the cup. Now, we use grape juice. And you'll be told this is the blood of Christ poured out for you. And you may take the bread, dip it into the cup, and then eat both together. It's an ancient Christian practice known as intinction. If you have little ones who may be more literal in their thinking, they're welcome as well. All ages are welcome, and they'll simply be told that Jesus loves them. If you need a gluten-free option, we have that available. That'll be right here in the center, and so wherever you are, you can come and um, receive that. And we also want to let you know that if you're a guest, that you're welcome to share in communion. You don't have to be a member of this church or of any church to share because it's Christ's table. And he says everyone is welcome. And he's our Lord. That means he's our boss. And so what he says goes. So whoever you are, wherever you're from, you are welcome here today. We also want to let you know that you don't have to, um, you're not required to come forward. Everyone is welcome. No one is required. So wherever you are today, it's great. We're so glad that you're here and glad that we have the privilege of worshiping together. So won't you come? We hope and pray that you will.
like a battlefield and my heart is overcome by fear and hope seems like a ship that's lost at sea my enemies on every side I'm tempted to run and hide the gentle We stand for ascending forth. I want to thank everyone that's been praying for my family this week, sending cards. Uh, my mom and my cousin are getting a little better each and every day. I appreciate you continue to pray for them and uh, appreciate that. And just want to say thank you uh, to each and every one of you. Now, I want to remind you what Jesus says about each and every one of his children, including us here, that you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Amen.